up, I give up. But winning the fight wasn't enough. Feeling that he should have won in seconds, not minutes, Bruce began developing a strict regimen to revolutionize martial arts. Bruce Lee took a hard and objective look at the art of combat, and he came away with it with some very profound truths, such as it is constantly changing. You cannot expect to fight in a one-dimensional aspect when fighting is multi-dimensional. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Lee also hoped that martial arts would combat racism by bridging the gap between Eastern and Western cultures. And when he was invited to perform at Ed Parker's Karate Championship in Long Beach, California, he astonished the crowd with his famous one-inch punch. He would tighten his fist and just deliver that one-inch shot of impact. But during that short distance in time, he would generate all of his body weight into the point of impact. And he said, let me show you something. And he turned to Tom, to my teacher, who was then one of Parker's black belts. And he gave him his little kicking bag. He kicked Tom the length of a swimming pool and into a flower bed. I was impressed to say the least. But despite his growing reputation in the martial arts field, Bruce Lee was frustrated. Still struggling to make ends meet, his schools were not bringing in enough money and the future at best seemed uncertain. What he didn't know was that fame was just around the corner. On February 1st, 1965, Bruce and Linda celebrated the birth of their first child, Brandon Bruce Lee. Bruce's greatest joy in his whole life was, was his children. He wanted to have a boy because it's a very Chinese thing to have a boy to carry on. He had a very, very, you know, keen sense of, of love for his son and, and he used to always brag and say he's the only blonde-haired, blue-eyed child in the world. <laughs> But just one week after Brandon's birth, tragedy struck when Bruce received word that his father, Lee Hoi Chuan, had died in Hong Kong. After flying home to attend the funeral, Lee returned to America more determined than ever to make his family proud of him. He focused all of his attentions on perfecting a distinctive style of martial arts eventually called Jeet Kune Do, or the way of the intercepting fist. He told us, uh, Jeet Kune Do is a bunch of concepts and philosophies and strategies, and you take out and make it fit into you. It's like a coat. You, everyone cannot sit, fit into a size 42 coat. It has to be tailor-made for you. He believed that he could take the best of many different kinds of fighting, a piece here and a piece there, from boxing, wrestling, martial arts, all sorts of different physical activity, and incorporate it into a single philosophy. Ultimately, martial art means honestly expressing yourself. I mean, it is, it is easy for me to put on a show and be cocky. So I can show you some f really fancy movement. But to express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself, and to express myself honestly, now, that, my friend, is <laughs> very hard to do. While Bruce was busy pouring all of his energy into martial arts, veteran TV producer William Dozier was searching for an Asian actor one that could star in a new TV series he was developing based on the classic Charlie Chan mysteries. A friend of Dozier's, Hollywood hairstylist Jay Sebring, had recently seen Lee perform at the Ed Parker tournament and enthusiastically recommended him to the producer. He said, well, listen, I've got the guy for you. It's a fellow by the name of Bruce Lee. He's a good-looking man. He's uh, got tremendous charisma. I'll call and see if there's some footage to show you. So he did, and as soon as Dozier saw it, he knew he had his man. Test X1. Now, Bruce, just look right into the camera lens right here and tell us your name, your age, and where you were born. My last name is Lee, Bruce Lee. I was born in San Francisco in 1940. I'm 24 right now. And you worked in uh, motion pictures in Hong Kong? Yes, uh, since I was around six years old. And when did you leave Hong Kong? 1959, when I was 18. I see. Now look over to me, Bruce, as we talk. I understand you just had a baby boy? Yeah. And uh, you've lost a little sleep over it, have you? Oh, three nights. <laughs> In 
1965, Dozier ordered this screen test for Bruce at 20th Century Fox Studios. There is the finger jab, there is the punch, there is the breakfast, and then low. Of course, then they use leg, straight at the groin, all come up. All, if I can back up a little bit, they start back from here, and then come back. <laughs> all right. It's kind of work. Unfortunately for Bruce, Dozier was now busy preparing his upcoming Batman series. Charlie Chan's number one son was scrapped. Although Dozier promised Bruce that he would keep him in mind for his next project, one based on a classic radio drama from the 1930s, The Green Hornet. They wanted to offer Bruce the part of Cato, but that wasn't going to happen until the following year because they wanted to make sure that Batman worked. So there we were, and now having moved to Los Angeles, and Bruce didn't have a job. Bruce Lee didn't have to wait very long. To the Batcave. Batman became a national phenomenon, and within weeks, Dozier began prepping the Green Hornet. No need for panic, Mr. Smith. After all, we're both on the same side of the law. Just cut us in on your racket. That's all we are after. Racket? It's getting late, boss. If we're going to be partners, Mr. Smith, we mustn't keep secrets from one another. Everything on a table where we can all see it. Impressed with Bruce's screen presence, if not his acting, ABC network executives accepted Dozier's choice of Lee as Cato, the crime-fighting chauffeur. And now, to protect the rights and lives of decent citizens, rides the Green Hornet. When the show premiered on Friday, September 9th, 1966, Bruce Lee leapt onto the screen and into stardom. He went from being a martial arts instructor to someone that everybody watched in prime time in North America. No one had ever seen anything like that. Soon the fan mail Bruce was receiving was out pulling that out of the star. Starring in the role of millionaire newspaper publisher Britt Reed, alias the Green Hornet, was a dashing all-American heartthrob named Van Williams. No more tricks, Carly. I'm here to talk business. The thing that impressed me about him then is, as always, was his intensity. You know, he was very, very intense. You know, if we ever meet up with that masked Kung Fu man again, I want him. But a very nice gentleman. Take it easy, miss. We won't hurt you. From that moment on, Bruce and I kind of started working on a friendship all, of, all through the series. After years of financial insecurity, Bruce was now a regular in the network TV series. And although his role was secondary to that of Van Williams, he was determined not to play Cato as a subordinate. He didn't want any chop sake or pigtail or bowing and scraping and that kind of thing, the way that Chinese had been um, portrayed. So that was his rule, that he would not do any roles demeaning to the Chinese culture. A perfectionist, Bruce worked hard to make his fight scenes as authentic as possible. Kung Fu is Kung Fu. It's not child's play. He soon learned the compromises required when filming for television. We had to slow up his action because we found in the test that he was moving too fast for the speed of the motion picture film. People may not realize he could have been faster than he was. Never as campy or colorful as their caped counterparts. Holy uncanny photographic mental processes! The Green Hornet and Cato failed to catch on with primetime audiences. In a desperate effort to save the show, Dozier and ABC concocted a face-off between Batman and Robin and the Green Hornet and Cato. No Batmobile. Good. We can get some work done first, and fast. And the original script was that he gets into a fight with Robin and loses. Holy split seconds, let's go! Well, he just went right through the roof. And he said, there is no way I'm going to get into a fight with Robin and lose. Bert had told everybody, you know, he's a big black belt and big tough guy. And Bruce had heard all about this. So he was going to play his Chinese water torture game on him. 
He let out little words. He was going to get this guy.